Hey folks, welcome back. This is The Process. My name is Dr. John Bush. We are continuing in our journey of trying to help you win your fantasy football drafts and your league this year. This is, I don't know, the eighth or ninth lesson here. This is in the format of a, a college lecture voice over PowerPoint, making a movie of it. I finished last time kind of talking about data coherence and set the, set the table for uh, principal component analysis, okay? I decided I thought this was the time to emphasize reference class forecasting as part of my methodology uh, that I try to use in my uh, data journey every off season here. Uh, so I guess with that, I'll move on to what the hell are you talking about? Uh, reference class forecasting is also known as comparison class forecasting. So you're actually comparing one say journey to another and that understanding what has gone previously as far as time resources level of commitment all this is important for planning any kind of journey right if you're going to build a house it's important to understand how long on average you know, a house of the size you're considering takes in your geographic area with maybe your builder. Okay, if your builder takes two years, uh, you should know that. Especially if the average is eight months, then you have certain expectations and you kind of know what you're dealing with. But if you didn't know that, uh, you know, you'd probably be getting cranky about six months in saying, where's my house? But, you know, six months is actually below average if you were to get your house. If you had, like I said, a reference forecast or a class comparison there. So it's a method for us to predict the future by looking at past situations and what their outcome was and uh, then uh, Daniel Kahneman and uh, Dr. Amos Tversky, uh, they got the Nobel Prize for figuring this out and they set up the theory behind it and it predicts the outcome of a planned action based on a class, your journey that's been done before. So it's no not surprising okay it's a way to do it so uh it's important to understand what's uh who's a, a winning player how long does it take for them to become a winning player in years right and i wish we knew that data we really don't uh that i know of and i'm not sure there's any way to test that maybe some type of survey but that would be an interesting aspect because uh, just by the nature of the game not everybody's going to win so be curious to see that kind of information so that's a comparison in other words if 50 percent of fantasy football players never win a league in 10 years that would be interesting information to know wouldn't it Anyway, reference class forecasting, I think, is a good model to allow us to deal with things that are uncertain about uh, the future, right? It's forecasting. It means it's a future, okay? And we're only, you know, as good as we can be on that. You can't expect, you know, unknown unknowns, the black swan events to occur. They can surprise us. So, uh, Kahneman and Tversky found that we, all of us, not just you, but me, 
we're optimistic due to overconfidence and we just don't know the district here here's the word distributional information about outcomes what that means is stats okay we are not aware of the stats the probabilities the percentages okay how long does it take to build a tree house if you're a kid it's important to know oh it takes 10 months kid needs to know that versus you know they get mad after a day you know the, well they were optimistic oh yeah i can go build that in a day so help your kids as well with reference class forecasts and if they said daddy i'm going to be a whatever well how long does it take what's the what's the uh effort required the resources we should all impart that on those that we care about to try to help them define their expectations i guess is is kind of on the human side of this we will underestimate cost times it takes to do things the risk or i would think probably should have said the word uncertainty uncertainty of actions and we will overestimate the benefits of those reactions okay so we're going to be biased and we could be disappointed by things so that's called taking the insider view you kind of have a group think concept we're all in this little area together and we're all talking the same thing we're going to be very surprised sometimes when the outside world comes knocking so the disregard of basically data and and stats uncertainty is probably the major source of forecasting error okay so you need to write that down and put it up on your mirror every day while you're thinking about fantasy football drafts we have to frame our forecasting fantasy football drafting using all the stats that's available and that's why i spent months folks months of time uh, fortunately I love to do this right because that's kind of who I am uh, months of time hours hours I have I make at least a thousand or more figures every year on off season okay okay so when I'm coming into your draft uh, yeah I'm prepared Okay, I'm not bringing a rubber knife to the gunfight, I assure you. But like I said, I'm not going to advertise that to you, you know. So uh, we have to try to make effort to do that. So I advise you to continue listening to my lessons. Uh, that's why I put them down now. You can re-listen to them. Uh, are you going to overestimate the effect of my lessons on your season? Probably. I'm going to just say it now. Okay. It took me a while to get the swing of things. We're talking years. Okay. So, just wanted to be straight up. So, you're saying, well, why listen then? Well, you either try to get better and move forward or you don't. Okay. So I advise you, uh, it's more fun when you win. So it's worth the effort, in my opinion. So taking an outside view is what stats allows us to do. Understanding things like principal components will give us that outside view okay and so it's a way that we will and i've used in science as well right how long does it take 
to find a gene that causes a disease. Uh, it's changed back in the 1970s and 80s. The answer to that question would have been years. Now with bioinformatics, it's, it's less than years, maybe months, maybe weeks even, okay? Imagine COVID back in 1960. We, did, we didn't have a lot of this information. Uh, been a lot rougher. So we're in the best position to deal with something like COVID and think of all the people that have succumbed to this terrible plague. But imagine not having all the tools that we have, you know, getting vaccines within this short time, okay? Look how long it took to get a flu vaccine, okay? So it's well worth the journey for just life. I hope some of my lessons rub off and help you in your life as well. That's my wish. Keep that good karma going. Please, uh, people that need uh, some lessons here, uh, send them to me. I know, not in your league, right? Okay. Uh, good karma. Don't, don't mess it up. So when we're doing the forecasting, just, and these are just, this is just kind of an overview kind of lesson here. Uh, we need to find similar past projects, journeys, and we need to figure those out and, and the journey it takes. I'm one data point. It's take, it took me probably three years ish but the amount of effort I spent went up logarithmically okay I went from just kind of paying attention about a week before the draft my first year I didn't know you know what what is all this to like it never ends for me now okay my data's it, it's it's 24/7, 365. Okay, I don't just pop up at, right before football season and here I am. I'm doing this all the time. You may not know it, and that's fine. I'm not here to uh, hit you with Twitter every every day about the latest thing and why I'm the best ever. Uh, you know, you can figure that out or not. So. We had to think of a journey and finding the stats on that journey, and that's fantasy football, and that's the heart of the lessons I'm going to be putting forth here. And we compare that to give us the outcome. So all I can say, my sample of one, is that it's helped me a lot going through this process. I've learned a lot. I've learned to use Excel and PowerPoints and pivot tables, and I've reviewed all the stats that I forgot back in, in you know, universities. I had to take a year of stats in graduate school, okay? And fortunately, my, one of my great collaborators, he teaches biometry, so I always have an expert on speed dial. Uh, he studies um, moths, butterflies, and hummingbirds, so he's not really into fantasy football, but he's always willing to help me on data sets. He kind of laughs some of the time I spend, but I'm very fortunate enough to have a stat guy that has been doing this all his life. He's actually a few years older than me, so he's a seasoned old professor as well. And it's good to have somebody to explain it to me because I do not know all this. Stats is not something that's easily thought about. It is hard to imagine things like probability. Okay, so that's kind of reference class forecasting. I've got a couple more figures here. So, uh, this is more to fantasy football. So what you said previously is information that's in Wikipedia and various things. This is where I take what's been done before and try to apply it. 
So step one, identify a reference class of past similar projects. To me, that means establishing the question. And I'm going to give you one question, OK? There's a bunch. What's the success of using last year's end of season fantasy points to predict this year's performances? OK? People loosely do that, but do they, you know, but do they understand when s s some group is 35th versus 36th? I think people who use tiers do have a point there to use the tier system as a way because it's hard to tease out uh, similarly grouped situations and tease them out. Okay, so I think the tier method of looking at stats is has a value. So there's your question. To me, it's, it's identifying a project. Uh, what's the, the second step? Basically, establish the stats for the parameters for that question using stats, if possible. At least try to do plots and visuals if you're not going to apply statistical tests. Maybe even simple ways to do success versus failure rates. That may be a way. You know, at least it's better than not having any measuring stick. Look at, say, the last 20 years, the teams that were top, top 10, and just go through the data. There are plenty out there. NFL.com, I'm sure. All these other data warehouses. Just take a pen and pencil. Put a little column, failures and successes, and start marking it out, figuring it out. Then count the total of failures and successes and figure out the number of successes divided by the total. That's percent of success. It's good to know that. Okay, so what proportion of teams who are in the top group are going to be good this year? On average, on average means that that you're not going to be right all the time, but on average you will. Okay, you need to think about that statement. It's hard to figure that. Well, you know. 80%, yeah, that means 20% you're wrong. So if you make 10 guesses, you're wrong two times, okay? So how does that correlate with winning and losing? If my top 10 players that I draft, you know, what's your success rate year in, year out? Are you about half? On average, probably about 60%. That's just some data that I have for myself. That means I'm wrong. The wrong could be injury, could be did not take into account changes, lots of factors. So, you know, I'm barely hitting the target over half. Uh, fortunately, I'm pretty good at working the waiver wire. Okay, so that helps. So the draft's not the end, it's just the beginning. But I think about 50%, 60% of the show is your draft. So it's critical. So what proportion of the teams that were good last year can we count on being good this year? So if you're trying to tie break, I would like players from better teams on average than players from worse teams. There's some exceptions. There's always exceptions. Nothing in fantasy, your data and your opinions need to be more squishier because you're, you're optimistic. You're missing your biases. So consider it more jello than granite. Okay, a little shaky. Always be a little shaky. Okay, is that a landmine I just stepped on? Try to develop that. Okay. 
So we compare in the past to establish the most likely outcome. So that implies having evidence of success in previous years, top teams, having the stats that tells you that understanding. What's the failure rate of that? You can compare the top six teams, the bottom six. On average, what's the information, what's the success and failure rates on the tops and the bottom, on the extremes? A lot of our statistical tests uh, deal at the uh, P05 range or less. That means a 5% chance that what the stats are saying is due to random chance. So you'll take a 5% error rate. That defines our level of trust in the stats. So it's best, if you can, to do the correct stats, correct, correct stats, one more time, and get a value that should define your trust. If you don't have that, then can you trust anything? Oh, well, I'm good at it. How do you know? Well, I'm over optimistic and in the best ever. Uh, <laughs> let me know what leagues you're playing in, okay? If you and I play enough times, I think I'll have a chance at beating you if you have that kind of approach. Uh, here's a statement. Statistical algorithms beat subjective judgments. The one thing, another thing I hear with pundits on the podcast, uh, by the way, I could care less if you want to see my talking face, okay, so I don't, it's not relevant to the data, okay, but I'm an old guy, okay, so I got a, I got a beard, yeah, old gray-haired, old, old fool professor. Crazy professor, that's me, crazy Dr. Bush. Statistical algorithms beat subjective judgments. In medicine, they have established, it's not a guess anymore, folks. It's not, it's not up to debate in a lot of critical areas, okay? Medicine was so out of touch because doctors used too much subjective judgments not enough stats on averages when you treat your patients, what success do you get versus their selective judgments. If you want to look up something, look up when newborns are born, we use the APGAR score. APGAR, name for a doctor. Before that, doctors, baby doctors would just kind of look and guess. There was no formalized way of assigning some stats to a baby. The APGAR score, babies are judged based on that score and treatment is based on that judgment. Okay. So stats beats subjective opinion based judgments. Sorry folks. Dims the truth. Okay. So it drives my research. I want to establish my forecasting to my questions. Okay, notice not your questions, my questions. You get to hang along for the ride. Uh, there are subjective judges that can get ahead of stats, but they're probably rarer than we all think. And there probably are, you know, genuine experts out there. Hard to be an expert. I'm not sure there are experts in fantasy uh, football, okay? Because we have no mechanism to test that. In science, we have a mechanism, okay? That's going and getting a PhD and going through a year process, five years usually on average. It's a process that you're undergoing checks and balances and publishing peer-reviewed data. Other people take pots at you and your opinions and your data and your experimental design all the time. 
I am used to blood in the water and getting chewed on. You cannot get a PhD having not got your butt chewed by professors. That That's our fun, okay? You think we're asleep until we're not, okay? So uh, peer review allows that journey and allows people to become an expert over time going through it. There's no way to do that in fantasy football, okay? There's no PhD in fantasy football. With that said, there are people who are getting PhDs in informatics, data analysis, etc. I would expect that those individuals who are 110% into fantasy football, I'm not sure you can make a career of it, but if you could, and you have the PhD handling data, then you probably will qualify as a fantasy football expert. I think there's probably money for those people. I'm not sure they're going to, you know, if I was that good, you're probably making a lot of money at daily fantasy sports. So maybe I'm wrong, but I'm not sure we know who's out there. They're probably laying in the weeds. I would be. Uh, you don't know what I do. I told you I don't play, but, it, you know, I don't. But if I did, I don't know how good I would be. I haven't risked large amounts of money on that. We all overestimate our subjective judgments versus the luck, right? We overdo our skills, underdo the luck. But you look at somebody else and you flip the judgment. I try to use reference class with the scientific method in conjunction with the stats and algorithms to balance out my biased self. I am biased. We should never have doubt, uh, absence of doubt. Sound like a double negative there. We sh Okay, our problem in fantasy football is the absence of doubt and scientific rigor. There's your another hot button statement. Anybody you hear on the podcast sounds like they're not in doubt at all. That should concern us all. They should be very doubtful. They're stepping on, walking in jello shoes and they don't even know it. So I urge all of you to consider reference class forecasting as a method to hit your own biases. Okay, I've covered a lot of material up to this point. Uh, the next lectures will be on establishing some variables that are critical in uh, using principal component analysis for quarterbacks, running backs, wide receivers, tight end. And that's just the beginning. That's not the end. I got hundreds of figures to go over, probably a thousand or more for just this season coming. I've already got about 400 done uh, already on my hard drive. Okay. I uh, hope you've enjoyed my pontifications. Uh, like I said, please share if these lessons are good. Please leave good goodwill, good karma, good talk. Uh, you know, let, let's hope you crush your leagues. I always want you to win, okay? I mean, as long as you're not in my league, I mean, I'd love for you to say, hey, I listened to some of your stuff, and it helped me do better. That's all we can ask for in this world. Okay, be nice, be sweet. Uh, we're having an extra amount of fun. Woo-woo. Come back.